Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing our uh, series in the book of Amos. And we also have today um, a church lunch. Um, we're getting back into the sort of pattern we had pre-pandemic. So we can gather together. Everyone's welcome to gather uh, for lunch after the service today. And then um, on Wednesday, we have our, our prayer meeting at 7.30 in the chapel here. That's where things really happen. That's where we get to present our requests to the God of the universe. And uh, we even did something last week, last Wednesday, that uh, contradicts what I'm saying this morning. You can uh, work that out later. Now, next Sunday, we have Daryl Jones with us, who is uh, from uh, Grace Baptist Mission, and he's going to be leading the service and also sharing something of the work of the mission. And also in... um, the, the afternoon, uh, we'll be having our uh, afternoon discussion meeting, which will be this time focused on these messages from Amos, what it all means for us. Well, let's hear these words from the psalmist. Give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wonderful acts. In that psalm, they go on to talk about what God has done in the life of Israel. Well, we have even greater wonders to tell the nations. We can say that Jesus, the Son of God, has died and risen again to save sinners. That's chief of God's wonderful acts. And that is how we have a message of hope, of joy, to give to this world. And that's where we're going to begin in our first song this morning. We have heard a joyful sound, Jesus saves. Let's stand and sing. Please sit down. Let's pray.
Our Heavenly Father, the Almighty God, we thank you that you are in charge. It is your plans that succeed. You know the end from the beginning. And we thank you that you are never at a loss to know what to do. We thank you that you are never powerless in the face of evil. We thank you for what we read in that psalm. Your acts are wonderful. All, everything about you is wonderful and glorious. And that is why it is so reassuring for us to come before you this morning, to bow before you, because we feel overwhelmed. We are overwhelmed in the face of destruction and bloodshed and cruelty and inhumanity and pride. And we come to you as the God who doesn't just talk about justice, but who brings justice. We thank you that you are utterly fair. No one escapes from your justice. We thank you that you will hold evil to account in Ukraine, in every place in this world. And we ask, Lord, that you would bring restraint. We pray for peace. We pray for protection of the weak. And we pray, Lord, for help for your church to hold out the truth, to hold out the hope of the gospel, that even from your people, even in the midst of war, there could be this joyful sound that Jesus saves, that that would ring out above the battle's strife. Heavenly Father, we are seeing the reality of evil, the reality of sin. We see how it multiplies, how it goes out of control, how it destroys. We thought we were free of war in this continent. We'd moved on from that. But you know, and I pray, Lord, that we would all understand that actually our hearts are the same. Sin has not changed. And that sin is in every one of us. We pray, Father, that even the events that we see going on around us, and who knows what else that goes on in our lives, that we would be real about sin. So often we are in denial. It's always someone else's problem. We, we excuse ourselves. We blame other people. Lord, help us to be real about our own sin, that we might turn to the only person who can help us the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has died and risen again so that we can be forgiven for our sin, that we can be set free from the power of sin, that we can live a new life that is given to you. Heavenly Father, give us hearts to hear that good news this morning. May we see how wonderful your salvation is in the light of the darkness of our own hearts. Heavenly Father, may this message go out into this congregation, into this town, and indeed into this world. May that message that Jesus saves be truly understood and responded to today, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Okay, we're going to come now to our reading from Amos chapter 3. And you'll find this on page uh, 645 in the church Bibles. Um, it'll be helpful to, to turn to that in some sort of Bible in front of you uh, for when we're looking at this again later. And just to remind you what's going on, um, Amos came from the southern kingdom of Judah, but he was speaking to the people of Israel, the northern kingdom. And in chapters 1 and 2, he's been addressing all the nations surrounding them and then homing in his message on Israel. And uh, he continues that in chapter 3. He's uh, an incredibly clever preacher as he sort of dismantles the, uh, the defenses of his hearers in what he does in this uh, message this morning. So let's uh, read now from the beginning of chapter 3. Hear this word the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth 
Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? Does he growl in his den when he's caught nothing? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground where no snare has been set? Does a trap spring up from the earth when there is nothing to catch? When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and to the fortresses of Egypt. Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. See the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord, who hoard plunder and loot in their fortresses. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun the land. He will pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. This is what the Lord says. As a shepherd saves from the lion's mouth only two leg bones or a piece of an ear, so will the Israelites be saved. Those who sit in Samaria on the edge of their beds and in Damascus on their couches. Hear this and testify against the house of Jacob declares the Lord, the Lord God Almighty. On the day I punish Israel for her sins, I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. Well, those houses with ivory, a hundred years before the king of Israel, a hundred years before Amos was speaking here, you had the king of Israel, Ahab, and he was known for having this uh, palace decorated with ivory. And this is one of the decorations he had. I think this is incredible. They've excavated his palace. You can actually see some of the stuff that was on his wall. And now what was happening in Amos' time, a hundred years later, a time where things were going far better economically, lots of people had all this in their houses. It wasn't just the king. They were known for their ivory decorations. Okay, let's have another. We're going to come back to something else we read there in that passage this morning. But I don't know if um, any of you, uh, you're familiar with the program Catchphrase, on the telly, where you, you're given these clues and you've got to try and uh, work out what, what, the, what the phrase is. So we're going to try and sort of do that here. Here is um, something I got in Germany years ago. Um, there's, uh, let's see what's, see what's inside here. What's this? What's that, do you think, on the side there? A toilet roll, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, this is a little toilet. And there's a little bit of German written in here. My German's a bit rusty, but it basically says something like, this is the only place you can get some peace. Um, so let me just uh, do something here. And see if this works. Okay. Now, right. Now, in a sense, all that I've said so far is a bit of a distraction. Can you see what's happening here? Smoke. Right. Can you think of a phrase that goes with smoke? What do people say? No smoke. No smoke without fire. That's great, yeah. So um, here's someone having a smoke in the toilet. And um, if, you've got, if you've got fire, you're going to get some smoke. Now, I'd better get this uh, stubbed out before we all... Um, 
set off the fire alarm, which would bring us to something I'm going to say in a moment. Um, so it's, it's sort of cause and effect, isn't it? If you've got fire, you're going to have a smoke. You're going to have smoke. So if you see, if you see smoke, something must be burning. The two things go together. And pretty much this is what Amos is doing in um, the whole list of questions he had in that reading. He talks about lions uh, roaring. And um, if you're a lion, you're not going to roar while you're trying to hunt down the prey because they're going to realize you're there and run off scared. They're going to be quiet. So... He's, he's not going to roar in that situation. But I haven't got a lion here, so I thought I'd try this with, with, a, with a cat instead. Um, here's Hagrid, uh, looking rather mean. So when Hagrid uh, meows, what do you think he's, uh, he's telling us? Hungry. He's hungry, thank you, yeah, yeah. It took me a while to understand that. Um, it, or he wants me to turn the tap on in the bath. If, if you don't understand that, look back at the Christmas service. Um, so, so when the cat meows, it's a sign that he's hungry, okay? The two go together. Cat's hungry, he'll meow. If he's thirsty, he'll meow. Now, here's um, another one we got here at the end of, further on in that reading. When a trumpet sounds in the city, do not the people tremble? Trumpet here is, is a warning. There's a warning of attack. When you hear that warning, people are going to be scared. Well, Here's, a, here's a, a different version of that. If you hear the fire alarm going off here, or say at school, what, what do you do? What do you do when you hear the fire alarm go off? What, what, what are you meant to do? Go outside. Right. Well, one day the fire alarm went off in, um, in the school I was in, and we were in a physics lesson, and uh, as the fire alarm went off, my physics teacher um, proceeded to go to where the alarm was in the classroom, get a big duster, and started tying it round the alarm to basically muffle the noise. And he told us all to stay where we were because he was wanting to finish giving us our homework before we did anything about the fire alarm. Okay? So, I think he realised it was... Uh, a practice. Um, there was one time where, obviously, they hadn't been told there was a practice and the alarm went off, and I'd never seen the teachers so scared, you know, <laughs> who's actually taken the register this morning, you know. Um, so he, he, uh, he didn't respond in the right way. If you hear a fire alarm, you're meant to get out of the building. Well, what about when we hear the gospel? When we hear this message of what Jesus has done, how he has died on the cross so our sins can be forgiven, how he is coming back to judge this world. What do we do? What, what's the right response to that? Well, some people do something pretty much like what my physics teacher did, which is sort of muffle it. Let's just... There's other things that are more important. Yeah, okay, there's a fire alarm going off, but, but the homework's more important. Yeah, I can hear this message about Jesus, but, but actually there's other stuff I want to do, other things are more important for me. Or you say, yeah, what a beautiful alarm. That's, 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 that's so nice to hear that this morning. Sometimes um, you know, people will go out of church and um, if, if, if they're kind, they sort of say things like, you know, nice message, pastor. Um, and you sort of think, but what I said this morning actually in one sense wasn't very nice. Or people think, well, you know, that's, that's a great message for, for my friend. It's a great message for someone else. You know, I can see some people that really need this message, uh, but not me. You know, other people can, can leave when the fire alarm goes, not me. Well, that's crazy, isn't it? We can see that that's crazy for a fire alarm, and it's crazy when we hear something that's actually far more important, this message of what Jesus has done. So when we hear this message, and all of us are hearing that here this morning, how should we respond well, it's not by ignoring it, not by thinking it's for someone else, not by letting it wash over us, but by trusting Jesus, turning to him, turning away from our sins, saying to God, I'm not going to go down that path anymore. I want to follow you. Please forgive me for my sin. You give your life to Jesus. That is the only sensible response 
to the gospel. And we're going to sing of uh, that response now. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Let's stand and sing. Well, just a reminder of our uh, pattern of meetings. We're trying to uh, restart now. We're uh, the other side of the pandemic. So today is the second Sunday of the month, which means we are having uh, a lunch together. Please do all stay for that. And it means next week we have our opportunity to, uh, to meet together in a different way for a discussion. And next week we're going to be focusing on what we've been looking at in Amos. All this stuff we're reading about this prophet from nearly 3,000 years ago, how does it apply to me? How, what, what use is this to me? How does this work in my life? That's what we're going to be focusing on. And if you've got um, other, other questions or things you want to go over or things you don't understand, there is a question box you can use or just uh, have a word with me. If not, you have to answer my questions. And then one other a reminder, in two weeks' time, there is, on the two weeks yesterday, there is the Save to Serve conference for young people, which in this case is defined as aged 15 to 25. And it's going to be a, a one-day conference uh, up in, in, in Highbury in London, um, very straightforward to get to. Basically, if you're wanting to go, please do book. Okay? You sort of think, oh, it's a long way off, long way off. Please do uh, get on and book. And it's a message for everyone. Everyone, okay, this one's for young people, but everyone is saved to serve. And in fact, churches can't function without that. To be able to come here on a Sunday morning, to find someone leading a service, to find a building with some heating on, to find a recording on YouTube, to find that the electricity bill has been paid... Someone has to do all of those things. That actually takes an awful lot of work, organization, a lot of service that we do on behalf of everyone. The one thing it requires is money. Without the giving of God's people, there could be no church meeting here in this way. And basically what we do here is funded by the people here. We don't we're not sort of funded by some sort of outside organization. And uh, here's a historical artifact. Um, before the pandemic, we used to uh, pass this thing around, which is uh, an offering bag where people um, could put money in. Well, we're doing things differently now. There is a, a beautiful cardboard box at the back that you can put, uh, if you want to bring sort of cash offerings, you can use, do that using that box uh, at the back. If it's more straightforward to give by a sort of bank transfer, please talk to Mike Fryer, the treasurer, and uh, he can help you sort that out. 
But because we don't sort of pass the background in the same way, it, it sort of means we've sort of, we've missed out on, in a sense, giving thanks to God for how he provides for us. So that's something I want us to do now in our prayers. And as we, as we give thanks to God for his goodness, let's pray for his help in how we use our money. It's, it's a big theme in Amos, isn't it? How we seek God for our needs. And we're also going to pray for one of the works that we support with. You know, one of the great things about um, people giving to the work here is that we're then able to give it to others and support other uh, aspects of God's work. And one of the things we support is the church in Bordeaux, the work that Maxime and Demelza are doing there. And if you haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, read the bulletin you get sent from Simon and it's explained in there for you. So let's, let's come to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed our loving Heavenly Father. That you tell us not to worry. You tell us not to worry about what we eat and drink and the clothes that we wear. You tell us to trust in your good provision, to trust in you. And Father, we, we pray, Lord, that you would protect us from something that's even more destructive than poverty. Protect us, Lord, from the love of money, where we are guilty of the sin of greed. Lord, it's so often something that we will see in other people, but never in ourselves. We pray that you would protect us. We pray, Lord, that you would give us hearts of generosity, that we would reflect you in that. You are a God who is generous. You are a God who gives out of himself. And we pray that we as your people would give out of what you have given. And Father, perhaps where we're in a situation where we do fear how we're going to pay the bills, where in a sense our concern with money is, is, well, there just doesn't seem to be enough. We pray, Lord, that our first port of call would be to turn to you, the God who has promised to meet our needs. We pray, Father, that we would look to you, that you would provide for us, that you would open up ways that our needs could be met. And we pray too, Father, for the needs in the church. We so praise you, Lord, that we are still here. It's an incredible thing when we think of how you have provided for us over the years, how you have met the needs of a, of a, of a little congregation with, in many ways, very limited resources. You have provided, and we thank you for that. We thank you for your daily provision. And we ask, Lord, that you would meet our needs in the days ahead. We pray, Father, that even as we seek to um, expand the work here, we ask that you might provide the resources for that. And we pray, too, for churches elsewhere, places where we seek to support your work in some way. We do, we do some way. We do pray for Maxim and Demelza in Bordeaux. We pray, Father, that you would meet their financial needs, help them in this great project of planting a church, of wanting to see lots of churches planted across France. And we pray, too, that you would provide for their needs for wisdom, for energy, for leaders, for just encouragement when the work can seem slow and hard. And we pray in particular for the meetings going on this weekend. We pray, Father, that you would equip those students that they are ministering to, that those students would be inspired to see how they can serve in your kingdom, how they can be witnesses of you, how they can be people that give in every respect, to your work. Heavenly Father, raise up a new generation of leaders, a new generation that will see many one for you in France. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing once more now, and, it's, um, and as we, we sing, it's going to be time for um, 
the primary age children to go to junior church. But uh, we're going to sing this uh, hymn together, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Let's stand. sit down. (coughs) Reflecting on the American Civil War uh, in the 1860s, Abraham Lincoln said that the two sides both read the same Bible, pray to the same God, each invokes God's aid, against the other. So which side was God on? See, Lincoln was on the winning side, but he wisely noted the prayers of both cannot be answered, and that of neither has been answered fully. God was on neither side. Now, I don't mean by that that God doesn't care about right and wrong, about justice. The Civil War in America was in part about slavery. And if Amos teaches us anything, it's, it's, not, it's, it's that God does not only care about injustice, he will intervene to bring justice. So God is not some sort of moral jellyfish. But rather... God doesn't belong to anyone. He doesn't belong to any side or cause. God is holy. And we sort of think of that in terms of moral purity, but it also means he is free. He is free, unconstrained by anyone's agenda. He's not bound by anyone, even his own people. Look at what happened to Joshua. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. It's the time of war, okay? So, understandably, Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? What do you think? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. 
Then Joshua fell on the, his face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. See, Joshua fitted in with this commander of the Lord's army, Jesus Christ, appearing to him there before his incarnation. So beware of claiming to have God on your side, claiming, in effect, that you are special, that you deserve special treatment from God. You see, there's lots of ways we can try and use God for our agenda. You can have God as your sort of business partner. God is there to make me prosperous. That's what I deserve. God is there to bless me. Or God is your sort of lawyer to stick up for you, to defend your good character, because after all, you are a lot better than those other people around you. Or God is the chair of the old boys' network. God's on my side because I was born into the right family the right country. I went to the right church. Or maybe God is your spokesman. God spoke to me. I have a word from the Lord. Well, that's convenient, isn't it? Because it means you're going to have to listen to me now if I've got a word from the Lord. I've got some power over you, haven't I? That's manipulation of God. Or God is your referee. He's there to affirm me. You know, it's great to have you on side. Great to have you on board. I'm so lucky to have you on the team. You know, because you're someone that's just so much sounder theologically than those other people. You're so much more reformed. Or even that um, you've suffered more, you've sacrificed more, you're special. God will vouch for you. Well, Amos undercuts that way of thinking. Because if anyone could claim to be special, it was Israel. God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. He'd given them incredible promises. They'd heard God's voice. They had God's commands in his own handwriting. They'd seen miraculous provision of food and water. All manner of astonishing miracles. And yet here Amos, as this sort of master preacher... As we were seeing last time, he traps his listeners. And it's it's masked a little in the translation here. Almost what he's saying is more ambiguous than it appears in in this translation. Let me just just read this to you in a different way. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. Hear this word the Lord has spoken about you, O people of Israel. About the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. And you'd be thinking, wow, yeah, we're the special ones. God's got this word about us. Isn't that wonderful? And it gets even better. You only have I chosen, have I known, of all the families on the earth. Therefore, I will visit you, is what it literally says. You think, wow, God's going to visit us. We're the special people. And then the bombshell, for all your sins. So this is a different sort of visit. It's not a visit to pat you on the back. To congratulate you, it's a visit, if you like, of the bailiffs. This is a word against Israel, not simply about them. So you see, they went from all ears to God is speaking this against them. He's saying, you know, you think God's on your side? Well, actually, God is against you. And God will punish you for your sin just like anyone else. In fact, your privilege, your blessings bring a greater responsibility. God is fair. There's no special treatment. God is not on anyone's side. So how does all that apply to us? Well, first of all, you belong to God. You might think, where do I get that from? Well, bear with me. God here is talking about Israel, which here seems to include both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah. He talks about the whole family. In other words, the whole nation that's descended from Abraham through Isaac. This is the nation, God's family, that he redeemed from slavery in Egypt. 
So what was it that made them special? Why did God do that? Well, it was nothing in themselves. It's because God had chosen them or literally known them, set his love on them in a a bond that was similar to that of a loving marriage. He loved them. But it wasn't because they were lovable. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. You you know, you, you were rubbish. But it's because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers and brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. God didn't need them. He chose to love them. And as part of that relationship, as you would expect, he spoke to them. Later on, Amos Amos talks about God revealing his plan to the prophets. God tells them of his plans. He tells them what pleases him how they're going to get along together. He gives them this law, which is really a, it's not not a list of rules, it's a pattern of life that would please God and and through which they would find blessing. And God was going to protect them as a nation because it was from this nation he would send a saviour that would be for all nations. That was all part of the plan that he revealed to Israel. So in short, Israel was no better than the nations around. They, They were just as sinful but they were given great privileges, told things that were not revealed to other nations. And what God is saying here is that they will be judged in the light of the light that they've received, the privilege that they've enjoyed. God is fair. There is no special treatment. Look at Jesus' words. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. But how does that apply to us? We're not the nation of Israel. Well, last time I said that Israel was like a sort of case study, a worked example of how God deals with everyone. The same principle... of of privilege and responsibility that we see worked out in the life of Israel applies to us. If you like, we also belong to God in one of two ways. If you're a Christian, if you're a Christian who has truly turned from sin, found forgiveness in Christ, you are rescued from hell. You belong to God forever. But if you turn back to sin, if you drift from God, that is something incredibly serious. You are sinning against grace. And you will know the Lord's discipline. You will lose the enjoyment, the assurance of salvation. Just as here, Israel was still under the covenant but they lost the blessings of it. And they faced the consequences of their sin. And if you're a Christian, you still face the consequences of your sin. If you commit adultery, if you succumb to the love of money, if you abuse power, you are not immune from the consequences of that. Peter puts it, judgment begins at the house of God. Think of the warnings that Jesus gives to the churches in the beginning of the book of Revelation. That they are, they are churches that are judged by Christ because sin and God don't mix, even in Christians. So there's an application there to Christians, to the church. But there's an application that actually applies to everyone. Whether you're a Christian or not, you are more similar to Israel than you might think. In fact, I would say you are more privileged than Israel. Every one of us belongs to God, whether you believe that or not. Every one of us has been made by God. We've been made in his image. He is the one who has given you life today. We could not exist without him. He wills your existence. He's given you life. And he's also given you his word. We have 
Bibles, which actually gives us more of God's word than Israel had. And we are not waiting for a promised saviour. The saviour has already arrived. Jesus Christ has come and lived in this world. He has died. He has risen again. And every single one of you knows that because I've just told you, even if you've only heard this for the first time, you now know that. And you are responsible to God for what you do with that. You will be judged in the light of what you know. And there's something really scary about this, that that hearing this message week on week, God will ask you one day what you have done with that. It's a serious thing to hear this message. And think of how this applies even to us as a nation. You know, we have more access to the truth here than you do in Saudi Arabia, for example. Well, what judgment can we expect as a nation from in, in how we turn, increasingly turn from what we know? Amos' message is a great leveler because he's telling us we are all guilty. In that sense, we are all the same. And that, I think, is such a lesson for our society where we are so sort of polarized. When you look at the sort of discussion you get in social media, it's so often very polarized into for or against. You're either with us or against us. In a sense, if you're with us, you're all good. If you're against us, you're all bad. There's no gray. The reality is we are all guilty. All of us have got enough sin of our own to stop pointing fingers. And as a church, you know, it's, we get very, it's very easy to sort of condemn a godless society around us. But do we forget that you find the same sins in the church as you do outside? The same pattern of money, sex, and power, the sins that are associated with that. There's plenty of that in churches. In a way, just as much as the world outside. We are not better. And we need to be, we need to be honest about that and humble ourselves before God because we belong to him. But the second thing here is your history belongs to God. Amos wasn't going to be very popular with this message. He's basically warning a nation that was doing rather well, a nation that was at peace, a nation that was prosperous. He was warning them of future judgment. He was warning that it wouldn't last. And you could almost hear the the people responding to Amos, well, how on earth can you say this about God, that God's going to do these things against us? You know, who are you to say these things? But Amos knows how to handle a hostile audience. What he does is he involves them so that they end up condemning themselves. He's a master preacher. He asks this whole list of questions uh, in verses, well, three to eight, really. These questions of cause and effect. So two walk together unless they've agreed to do so. You could almost put it like this, you know, if, if two meet for coffee, it's because they've planned to do it. Yes, occasionally this can happen just by chance, but the normal pattern is that's something that you arrange, that you plan. And a lion doesn't roar when it's hunting. That would scare the prey away. The roar is a warning, which is why God is described as roaring like a lion. He talks about these traps for the birds. But in doing so, Amos is setting a trap for his hearers. Because as he goes through these questions, you know, do two walk together unless they've agreed to do so? No, of course not. You know, does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? No, of course not, the people are replying. And he goes through all these questions. When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? Well, of course they do. It's cause and effect. When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Well, of course. And then they would realize what they've just said. Because they've just said that if disaster is going to come to their city, this isn't simply the actions of an evil nation around coming against them. It's God's work. 
Think of what they would say when the earthquake struck two years later, remembering these words of Amos. This is God's work. They're acknowledging here that God sends disaster as well as blessing. If God judges those nations around them, he will also judge Israel. You know, judgment is one of those things we always agree with in theory, isn't it? Yeah, of course people should be judged. It's just other people. But Amos is saying, no, that applies to you too. But how can Amos say this? Well, it's because God has revealed his plan to him. Verse 7, the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Amos has heard the counsel of God. It's like he's in the sort of command center of heaven. Imagine that. Imagine being in the command center of a sort of military unit. Well, Amos here is in the command center of God. He's hearing God's inner thoughts. And so you can see why he then says in verse 8, well, how can you not prophesy if you've heard this? How can you keep that to yourself? This is a direct line from God. So the message in all of this is very simple. History is not random. We are not simply at the mercy of fate or of random forces. God is not some sort of absent landlord who's distant, but rather he's ruling over everything. And almost the reason I think Amos talks about all these things going on in nature, his point is that God is ruling over all of these things too. This is how he's organized the world. God is ruling over everything, not just the religious stuff, but nature, governments, the economy. Have you ever thought about God rules over the economy? War, earthquakes, God is near. And I'd nearly made the title of this sort of heading here, History Belongs to God, and missed off the your. But I thought, well, no, that's actually too general and vague. If God is ruling over everything, that includes your life, your story. God is not this distant person. And so what's happening in your life is not random. It's not just, oh, whatever happens, happens. Nor are you the master of it, controlling your destiny. The reality is your life is part of God's plan, whether you acknowledge him or not. God will be glorified in your life, even if it's in righteous judgment. In short, God wins, however much you want to rebel. But if you do follow him, isn't it reassuring to know that everything in your life, what you would count as good and bad, is part of God's plan. You are not at the mercy of events. You're not at the mercy of other people. But you are part of God's perfect purpose. God is revealing his secrets here. And in verses 9 and 10, we see how he reveals yours. He exposes your secrets. Your secrets belong to God. What I mean by that is they are his concern. What you do and think is God's concern. And I think that bristles against us because we value privacy, my private life. What I do in private is no concern of yours. What our politicians do in private should be of no concern, we're told. Well, it is God's concern. How you treat your wife at home, who you sleep with, how you spend your money, the addictions and habits you may have, all of those are God's concern. And actually, as a Christian, they are also the church's concern. Not in a sort of controlling way, but in the sense that we are accountable to one another. There's a sense in which there is no private life as a Christian. It matters how we live. 
But how does this link to what's going on here in Amos? Because it seems that there's nothing very secret here. God is, is saying in verse 9, you know, proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and Egypt to assemble on the mountains of Samaria and to see something that is very public. It's a public gathering. He's calling the Philistines and the Egyptians as witnesses. These were nations that were long-term enemies of Israel, that had oppressed Israel, nations that were brutal. And yet they are now called as witnesses to see the same sins in Israel. In other words, Israel is not morally superior. They are now being condemned by the nations around that they would have despised. And God does this precisely because he does see what is happening. And he calls it out. God sees the victims here. You know, we don't often read the Bible from the victim's perspective. But imagine how pe people that were suffering under this oppression in Amos' time would have heard these words. These would have been music to their ears. God has seen what's going on. And Amos here is a voice for the victims as well as for God. He sees in verse 9 the, the unrest causing oppression. God understands that a breakdown in society hits the poorest most. God sees what is hoarded. And literally there, those who hoard in ver verse 10, it's, it's literally hoarding violence and destruction. In other words, the physical things they're hoarding have come from violence and destruction. They've been looting property. That's how they've obtained all this stuff. And as a result, people are trampled. It's about things, not people. And of course, all of this stuff is often hidden. How much violence is hidden in homes, in bedrooms? How much oppression of workers is hidden? There's no contract. There's no paper trail. That's deliberate. It's to keep it hidden. But God sees it all. But you know, Israel, I think, was blind to this. This would have been a bit of a shock to them. On The, uh, the Apprentice this week. The, uh, the teams were to design a, a brand of baby food. And one of the teams came up with uh, the sort of brand name First Time Foodies, which sort of sounds okay. The problem was when they did the design for this, the way they, they did the lettering and the design, what you saw as you looked at this label was First Time Dies, which is not the best thing to sell baby food. But the strange thing was, they didn't, they, they, you know, they were focusing on this, these are people, you know, that said we're experts in marketing and all this sort of thing. You know, they, they concentrated on this, there was even, you know, several of them doing this, but they hadn't spotted it. And it was only when they started pitching to the retailers, they said, why well, have you got the word dies in your, in your, um, in your brand name? They didn't spot it. And we laugh at that. But the problem is, we do exactly the same about things that are far more serious. Israel here, it seems, did not know how to do what was right. They didn't even understand what right was. Verse 10, they do not know how to do right, says the Lord. Even though God had told them, and they would say, yeah, we're, we're people that know all about that. We're the people with, with God's commands. We know all this stuff. But they didn't. They were blind to it. We can be blind to what is obvious to others. And it's not that, you know, poor them that they just didn't understand. The problem was they'd become so hardened in their sin that it'd become normalized to them. And you can imagine how they might try and justify it. They'd say, look, we're not oppressing the poor. We just want to have a nice house. You know, this, don't you think this ivory looks rather nice in our, in our living room? But they weren't joining the dots. The fact that they were spending the money on the ivory meant that they couldn't be spending that money on the poor. Money is always about choices. Oh, I don't have money for something. 
well, what do you have money for? Same with time. Oh, I don't have time for that. I don't have time. Well, what do you have time for? When you look at what you spend your time doing through the week, it's always, we, we have all the time there is. The issue is what we do with it. And these people weren't joining the dots. And we are, we are so good at finding ways to justify ourselves, to find what seems like good reasons to justify our sin. Well, I'm just trying to look after the family. Or, as Matt Hancock put it, I think, last week, you know, oh, I, I just fell in love. Really? Is that an excuse for what you did? You know, we're horrified by Putin's um, manipulation of the media, his, his excuses, his denials, his, his um, you know, I'm, I just want to protect Russia. Sounds good. We're, we're horrified by his sort of manipulation of the truth, but understand we can do the same. We start to create a, a sort of parallel universe of self-justification. It's never me. Greed is always other people. We will only listen to voices that affirm us, that agree with us. But understand this, the truth belongs to God, including your secrets. But finally here, God, your house belongs to God. Amos is speaking here in a housing boom. <clears throat> Talks here about the fortresses, the castles. An Englishman's home is his castle. The summer and winter houses. These were holiday homes. Just like today, owning more than one home was a, was a sign of status. And these, it seems these were lavishly decorated with the ivory. You know, Solomon had a throne of ivory. But now you had ivory in all the houses. And there's also a religious house in verse 14, Bethel. The name Bethel means house of God. This was false worship introduced by Jeroboam I. Very close to Jerusalem. I didn't realize this. Just 10 miles north of Jerusalem. And the horns of this altar he talks about, well, that was a place of refuge. If you could hold on to the horns of the altar, you were safe. It was like sort of claiming asylum. But God says that's going to be cut down. And what is common in all of these houses is that they were all things that they trusted in. You know, when, you, when you're at home, it's, it's where you're safe, it's where you're secure. It's sort of what you trust in. And so, using this word house here, it's, it's, it's really a, a sort of a picture of whatever we trust in. And I, in a sense, deliberately put the heading like this to be provocative, because I think it's something that is particularly peculiar to United Kingdom culture, where houses are a particular sort of idol. We have this obsession with house prices and house ownership. We have an economy where, where your house is an investment as much as a place to live. It's about providing economic security. Now, this is where Amos is very searching. I speak as a homeowner. It's not wrong to own a house. It's not wrong to want to own a house. But my question is, what do we trust in? Amos is very uncomfortable. So the heading here really is, whatever you trust in belongs to God. And if it belongs to him, he can take it away. Whatever you have, whatever you trust in, you have it on loan. Your health, if you like, is on loan from God. Your house, your car, your job, whatever, it's on loan. And what does God say here? I will tear it down. Who will tear it down? The Lord God Almighty, in verse 13. The Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. He will tear down whatever you trust in. So there's justice what was gained by plunder will be plundered. And verse 12 is deeply cutting in what God is saying. This strange thing about the, uh, 
the shepherd saving from the lion's mouth two leg bones or a piece of an ear. And he's saying Israel will be saved like this. It's not rescue. You see, if, if what he's referring to here is evidence that the animal has been eaten. It's what you did to prove that you hadn't just stolen the animal, but it had actually been eaten by a wild animal. You would show these bits that were left. So if you like, it wasn't evidence of being saved. It wasn't evidence of rescue. It was evidence of destruction. That the sheep was no more. And the second half of the verse that's, that's a bit obscure, it's, it's probably the best way of understanding it, is, is these, all that's going to be left is scraps of furniture. And notice luxury furniture. Most people would sleep on a mat on the floor, but they, here it's talking about the couches. So it's a bit like finding a chair leg or a bit of upholstery in the rubble of an earthquake. That is, you don't think, oh, wow, I've got a chair leg. Isn't that great? No, no, that's, that's evidence of total destruction. This means it's of no use as furniture. That's the picture that God is given here. So all that you have, all that you trust in, belongs to God. And he can take it away. So what are you left with? God. It all belongs to him. How do you respond to that? I'm angry about that. I want to fight for my rights. God's invading my space. I want to make my plans succeed. Well, to respond like that is to treat God as your enemy. But have a think for a minute. You're the aggressor here. You invaded, if you like. You rebelled against God. God is the one who is good. You are not special, but God is. So isn't a different response actually rather more sensible? Doesn't it make more sense to swap sides? In verse 8, God talks about the lion roaring. Well, if a lion roars, you fit in with the lion, don't you? You don't tell the lion what to do. But you can hear that roar in two different ways, depending on which side you're on. <clears throat> Think of C.S. Lewis's uh, Narnia stories. When Aslan the lion roars, the white witch is terrified. But the children are thrilled. It fills them with courage, reassurance, and hope. Because they are on his side. See, are you on God's side? Amos responds to the lion with trust, with obedience, he hears God's word, and he doesn't suppress it. He spreads it. He owns it. He believes it. Amos here is really surrendering to God. The sovereign Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? What else can he do? And if you surrender to God, all of those headings, maybe you thought, these headings are all a bit negative. You know, it belongs to God, that belongs to God. Well, hang on a minute. You put your head around this the right way. Those headings are all positive. It's a wonderful thing that I belong to God. It's brilliant that my history belongs to God. It's so encouraging that my secrets belong to God, that my house is his, that I can walk with him like those two that agreed to do so in verse 3. You see, God's word demands a response. We are in a time of grace. This is a moment of opportunity. If you like, there's a window of escape. The warning has been sounded. The judgment has not yet arrived. So now is the time to switch sides. Now is the day to trust in Jesus. Let's finish with a hymn that uh, speaks of our response to God's word. From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. And then in verse 4, grace sufficient, grace for me, grace 
for all who will believe. That is what we find when we come to God and go on to his side. Let's stand and sing. Please sit down. Let's pray. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? Our Heavenly Father, we have heard your voice today. We read your word. The same word that you gave to Amos is your word to us today. And we pray, Father, that we wouldn't suppress it we wouldn't try and muffle it, we wouldn't move on from it or apply it to someone else, but that we would fear you, that we would come to you to see that you are the God that we need. You are the God who is good. You are the God in whom forgiveness is found, new life is found, hope is found in the direst of circumstances. We have your promises. And we ask that we might believe them, that we might trust in what you have said, that we might turn to Christ and find in him the saviour that we need. May your word do its work in our hearts today, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.